Hi, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about optimizing Spark QDFs. Um, I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Before we start the session, let me introduce myself. My name is Shivangi. I'm a senior engineering leader at Informatica. Um, I have about 10 percent years of experience dealing with database systems, distributed computing, and other big data technologies like Spark, Hadoop, etc. So. Um, let me just give a brief background about what Informatica is. So Informatica is one of the leading uh, providers of data engineering solutions. We have a suite of offerings uh, ranging from data integration solutions to cloud data management, data quality, data governance, et cetera. For all of these offerings, we do use Spark extensively. We were one of the early adopters of Spark. So we started with Spark 1.6 and we are at Spark 3.0 right now. As we started solving our use cases, we took the open source version of Spark and really innovated on top of it to solve our uh, different kind of data engineering specific use cases. All right, so here's the agenda of the session today. We are going to um, start with the introduction to UDFs. We'll walk through certain examples, benefits of UDFs, then we'll talk about performance considerations. And that's where the optimization part comes in. We'll talk about the suggestive alternatives that we can take to optimize UDFs. And then finally, look at some performance results. So what are UDFs? UDFs are user-defined functions, which basically I'll give you the ability to extend Spark's language. Um, it is something that you can write a custom function for, register it against the Spark language, and then use it as a native function across your Spark programs. So a typical example of UDF, how you would define that would be um, here I'm like for simplicity defining something really, really simple. I just want to define the plus one operation. So I define a UDF by just saying this is a Scala function that does X plus one operation. Um, I go ahead and register it against a UDF registration framework. I give it an alias. So here I've provided the alias as plus one. And that is how you would recognize, Spark would recognize the function. And then you can go ahead and use it in your language. You can say select plus one, and you get the results for that UDF. So what are the benefits? As you saw, it helped us extend the built-in capabilities of Spark SQL. It's very simple and straightforward to implement. So I didn't have to do much to implement the operation. All of the complexity just lies within the function that you're trying to implement. Uh, it does come with a plug and play architecture. So you build it once and then you can use it across different Spark programs. And also the APIs are pretty stable. So they are backward compatible. So if you're moving from one Spark version to another Spark version, we don't have to worry about changing these UDFs or your Spark program specifically for these UDFs. Now at Informatica, we extensively utilize UDFs. We have our own expression language and these functions are not available natively with Spark. So we decided to go the UDF route. But as we started looking at the performance of our application, we realized that there were several performance bottlenecks that were there with UDFs. Um, Spark Optimizer has evolved over a period of time from like 1.6 version to 3.0. There are a lot of optimizations which have been added, but we could not utilize those optimizations because of using UDFs. So anything like whole stage code gen, null optimization, predicate pushdown, everything was getting blocked. Another thing that we observed was um, Spark tends to treat its strings as UTF-8, but when you exercise a UDF, it gets converted into Java runtime, which is using your java.lang.string, which means that it has UTF-16 encoding. And we were going back and forth between UTF-8 and UTF-16 which was an expensive operation. So anytime you had sync input or a string a return type, it added cost to your UDFs. So let's look at some of these things in play. So here I'm trying to analyze the physical plan and see how Spark is actually implementing a native operation versus a UDF. So if you see, um, I'm doing a very simple operation, plus one operator, I select the value and it's pretty unremarkable. Um, I do the same thing with plus one. And the physical plan looks almost exactly the same. But that's because the plus one operation here, Spark did not have 
room for a lot of optimizations. So we want to get a little more creative and see when the spots optimizer comes into play. So here I'm trying to do the same plus one operation, but I'm applying a filter on top of my data frame. So I do data frame dot filter operation. I use my X plus one operator and say X plus one should be equal to two. Very simple. But when you look at the plan, you see the highlighted portion and that highlights that there is a pushed filter in my physical plan. So Spark was actually able to push down a predicate. Now let's look, analyze the same thing with plus one. So I'm again, exactly doing the same operation. I replaced my X plus one with plus one UDF that we just created. And if you look at the physical plan and we are specifically looking at the highlighted portion, we see that Spark was unable to push down any filters. So this is a simple operation, but as your queries go arbitrarily more complex, this performance cost adds up and the UDF starts slowing down Spark programs. So looking at this, we decided that we need to redesign our UDFs to make our programs more performant, but we wanted to keep the benefits of UDFs, but still get the performance benefits that we get from Spark Optimizer. That was the, our main design goal. We wanted to get this, these capabilities with minimal changes, but still treat UDFs as native Spark functions. So let's walk through what we decided to do at Informatica to make these UDFs more efficient. So here, if you're not aware, um, the expression framework from Spark comes from the SQL Catalyst project. So what we wanted to do, since we wanted to maintain our own isolation, we created a new project. So you create a completely new project, which we call Infi Expressions here. The only thing you want to do is maintain a project structure, which is similar to your Spark SQL Catalyst thing. So if you see, we follow the same packet structure, you define that, and I define all my expression classes inside of that packet structure. The next thing to do, is for us to be able to make Spark understand that anything that I'm implementing is actually an expression in Spark's language. So how does Spark understand that? For Spark to be able to recognize anything as an expression, we need to extend it from their base expression class. So there is a base expression class under your org Apache Spark SQL Catalyst project, and it has um, certain implementations which are already available for you to use like unary expressions, ternary expressions. These are for like single argument, multi-argument expressions. So you can even extend from that. What we are looking for basically is to satisfy the expression contract that's defined by Spark's expression class. So here um, you might want to look at these two methods which are there, which are do, do gen code and eval method. These are the two things that we have to specifically define for to define the functionality that's uh, represented by the, this UDF. If you're curious, Spark has all of its functions under this following location. You can go to the Spark code under the SQL Catalyst project. Look here, and there are a lot of samples available to like get inspiration on how these functions can actually be implemented, which are like really performant. So keeping that in mind, we decided to re-implement our function. So here, for example, I'm going to re-implement the same thing, the plus one that we were doing before. I want to make it a native function. So I'm going to use this as plus one native. I'll call that as plus one native. For simplicity and distinction, I create a class which is plus one native. It takes in a single argument, so I extend it from the unary expression class. And also I make it null intolerant. So that's something that predicate pushdown looks for. So these are the kind of constraints that you have to look for if you're going after a certain particular optimization. This is similar to how Spark would identify even for native functions. So we are not adding any extension to the functionality, but trying to understand Spark's logic of applying these optimizations. I go ahead and I re-implement like the do code gen method and null safe eval. So with unary expression, you can either implement eval or null safe eval. I chose to implement null safe eval. So I have that here. So once I have done that, the next step in the process for me after defining this class is for Spark to recognize that this is indeed a function. So I need to create a registry for it. I need to create, I created a function definitions file. All of these functions definitions file for Spark today exists under 
the same project and it's called the functions.scala. So I created a similar file, which is impa functions, and I defined all of the functions that I'm planning to implement. So if you see, I have plus one native here. So this is uh, the name that would be used by Spark to recognize the function. And I actually, along with this, give it the definition of what it's implemented by. So if you see, I define that my plus than one native class is what defines this function. Once I'm done that, I'm actually done implementing my UDF. All I now need to do is compile and make Spark aware of this jar. So you compile your project and the next thing to do is to make Spark aware that this jar exists. The simplest way to do that is to add this in the Spark assembly. You can go to the Spark jars folder and drop in your jar there. Once we drop in our jar there, we are good to go. So now having done that, I can just go to my Spark shell or write a Spark code. All I need to do is import this function. So if you see, I imported infa functions dot plus one native, and I was able to utilize this function as any other native Spark function. A caveat, a lot of us do use SQL queries for Spark SQL. And if I'm doing that, I need Spark's parser, SQL parser to be able to understand that this expression exists. And that knowledge actually comes from the function registry.scala class. This um, function registry again exists under the SQL Catalyst project. If you have to use SQL queries, you will have to edit this file. So this is only a small change that you have to make into the Spark code. So how would we do that? We download the Spark code for the world version that you're using, and we go under the Spark Catalyst project. Uh, we find the file functions.registry scala and register our function. So if you see, um, I have added my function. You say that this is the function. It's defined by plus one native class. And I give it an alias, which is again plus one native. That's how the SQL query is going to recognize that function. Now I again need to recompile my Spark code. The one thing to note here is when you're recompiling, you need your Catalyst project to be aware of this new project that you've added, which actually has the definition for plus one native. So I'll be edit the POM file, add a new dependency, build the Spark class Spark Catalyst jar. And once we have the new jar, we do the exact same thing of going under the Spark assembly. And now I replace the existing Spark Catalyst jar with my new jar. Once I have done that, uh, that's all the steps that I need to do. Uh, so once we have added to the functions registry, I can go back to my Spark shell, execute a query that uses plus one native function. So if you see, I'm trying to do a select plus one native from a table and I get the results. So Spark was able to actually recognize plus one native as an existing function and give me the results. So now that we've done all of this, we go back to our original point. The reason we wanted to do all of this was to utilize Spark's optimization. So now let's see if Spark able to actually optimize these native functions. So I do the same operation that I did and where I showed you that UDF was not able to push any predicates down. I select from my, I filter my data frame. I apply the same operation, which is plus one native equal to two, and I look at my physical plane. And here we see the highlighted portion shows that I was actually able to push down the same filter that a native plus one operator was able to do. So this kind of proves that yes, Spark is able to use these functions now and use them as native functions and allow them to participate in their optimization step. So let's talk about some more tips and tricks. Also along the way, we realized that, you know, when we are writing these functions, we want to be especially careful about how we are coding these functions because that does contribute to the performance overhead. We should definitely consciously make an effort to avoid temporary object creation. It's not apparent with smaller data sets, but as your data set size grows, you, see, you start seeing the uh, effect of garbage collection on temporary objects. So it starts becoming, it, it starts becoming as an overhead to your performance. On the same lines, we should try using Scala's while construct over for because for will cause temporary object allocation. We should consider using imperative style over functional style. The other thing is you might consider using thread static variables to allocate temporary buffers and that's to avoid synchronization issues. 
So I did men talk about the UTF-8 to UTF-16 conversion initially, which was like a significant overhead for string operations. But sometimes this conversion is actually necessary. You cannot avoid it. But in those cases, you might want to actually consider lazy conversion instead of actively converting all strings from UTF-8 to UTF-16. You might want to inspect your strings and then only convert. That also gives significant performance benefit. So having talked about all of uh, the things that we can do to improve the UDF performance, let's look at some of the performance results. So here I'm looking at a string function. This was our re-implementation of the substring function. Informatica expression language defines substring in a slightly different way from what Spark has. So our contracts were different, so we decided to re-implement it. And we re-implemented it, keeping it all the previous things in mind. Here, um, the orange bar is a UDF, and the lined bar is actually when we converted it into a native function in Spark's language. As you observe, like with, um, and I'm going from scale factor one to 50, so we are looking at one gigabyte to 50 gigabytes of data. When the data set was smaller, the performance was still better, but it wasn't as apparent. But as your data size starts growing and 50 gigabytes is not a lot of data, you see that the performance is considerably faster. Like an operation as far program that was taking 18 minutes now takes just six minutes for us to like, you know, execute. Let's look at some more performance numbers. So here I'm looking at the date function. Um, Again, the, here we were trying to do add to date, to date kind of operation. Um, we here, the rewriting specifically considered avoiding temporary object creation. So we used a lot of while loops and avoided any temporary object creation. And we observed that like for larger data sets, we could actually see a 100% performance gain for our data sets. And finally, here's some numeric function. We just re-implemented the rate function for us because that comes from our expression language. And this was already like an efficiently written function, but just making it native, like gave us about 50% of performance boost. So as you can see, like if we start utilizing a lot of these things that we have talked about, we can get significant performance gains. Like the performance results that we were looking at were for very simple operations. We were just trying to evaluate the performance of that particular UDF getting converted into a Spark native function. But if you have a lot of these UDFs in your Spark program and your program becomes arbitrarily large, you will see even faster performance than what we've seen in our performance benchmarking. All right, so with that, I conclude my talk and I'll leave the floor open for any questions, feedback that you may have.